can we dive in a little bit into lithium batteries a little bit and uh, maybe sure. maybe talking about a little bit, you want to weigh in on the pros and cons of making that choice and what are the implications of going down the lithium uh, path for boaters, especially mm -hmm. the ones that are converting from you know, standard lead acid, flooded or AGM. What are the implications? Yeah, so um, the first thing I think we should talk about is chemistry because there's an awful lot of, um, of, of poor information on, on this. We have basically lithium ion phosphate and then we have all the other chemistries, nickel, manganese, cobalt, nickel, cobalt, and aluminum, and so on. Um, the fundamental difference between the lithium ion phosphate and the other chemistries is that if, if you screw things up and the battery goes into a condition known as thermal runaway, where it's essentially generating heat internally and it's out of control, the uh, lithium ion phosphate batteries will not generate enough heat internally to spontaneously ignite, and all the other chemistries will. So you see an awful lot of people arguing that lithium ion phosphate should be treated differently and it's intrinsically safe and it's the only chemistry we should have on our boats. Uh, well, it's just not true. If you go into thermal runaway on any of these batteries, you get uh, a lot of heat inside the battery, you get thermal expansion, uh, you get short circuits in the battery, you likely get sparks and hot spots, uh, and then all of these batteries, the, the electrolyte is flammable, at which point a lithium ion phosphate battery can catch fire um, just like the others. Maybe not burn quite as intensely, but it can catch fire. So the idea that they're intrinsically safe is just not true. Uh, just because they have a different chemistry doesn't mean they can't catch fire. And I have plenty of pictures of burned up lithium ion phosphate batteries. Uh, the critical issue to my mind is the quality of the construction. A well-built nickel manganese cobalt battery is going to be safer than a poorly built lithium ion phosphate battery. So what we should be focusing on is the quality of the construction, the reputation of the battery manufacturer, what standards that the battery has been tested to, because we do have some abuse testing mm. standards in the marketplace, the most aggressive one that I know of being UL 1973. And any battery that can pass UL 1973, doesn't matter what the chemistry is, is very, very unlikely to propagate any kind of a problem outside of the battery case. And that's really what we're looking for. We're looking for a battery management system that will make sure that we don't get into the thermal runaway condition in the first place. And secondly, we want a battery that's constructed such that if things do get out of control, it stays within the case and doesn't get propagated outside of the case to the bubble. So that's yeah. more to do with, with quality and standards than it is to do with chemistry. Uh, and then, um, and, and let's say, for example, Torquedo, probably on a numeric basis, I'll bet with all the little uh, outboard motors and their other systems, they probably have more batteries in the marine space than all the other manufacturers put together. Torquedo is using nickel manganese cobalt, and I don't know of a single Torquedo battery that's burned up a boat. Mm. I do know of some lithium ion phosphate batteries that have burned up a boat. So again, it comes down to the construction and the quality and the battery management system. And then the other key issue is that battery management system has to have external communication and it has to be able to send a signal. If it sees, for example, an over voltage condition, it has to be able to send out a signal to shut down the battery charger or the alternator or whatever is charging the boat at that point in time. Um, and very few of these batteries have that external communication uh, but because they recently released AVYC lithium-ion standard, I think it's T13, I, no, E13, I think is the number, uh, basically uh, wants to see that external communication and it wants to see the battery alarm the operator before it disconnects. That's going mm. to require that level of communication. And we're all already seeing some of the the, the battery manufacturers that have had the drop-in batteries without external communication, doing things like putting Bluetooth into the case so yeah. it can send a signal to comply with the standard. So, so that's what we should be looking for, is 
a, a recognized brand, quality construction, and compliance with some standards, which will pretty much guarantee that battery never threatens the boat, regardless of what happens yeah. to it and what kind of stupid things we do to it. Because sooner or later, we'll maybe put on a new battery charger and not wire it up properly, or we'll change the alternator and it, it won't be talking to the battery. Uh, sooner or later over the years, somebody on that boat is likely to do something stupid, and we need the battery to be able to handle that and not get out of control. Yeah. I, and they can. And, and we've had very few boat fires. And actually, I think a number of the ones that have really hit the headlines are probably not from installed lithium-ion batteries. They're probably from supplementary equipment, like that boat that burned up in California where the 30-odd people died. They were charging oh, a whole bunch of underwater light batteries and phones and stuff like that. The, it wasn't – I don't boat? believe it was an installed – What's, yeah, yeah. I don't believe it yeah. was an installed system that set the boat on fire. And we've had some super yacht fires where they have these um, toys. They'll have um, personal watercraft that are powered with lithium-ion batteries and things like that. Um, we've had some of these toys catch fire. Uh, we've had, to my knowledge, very few installed, well-installed lithium-ion batteries that have, that have caused problems on boats. And we must have tens of thousands of them out there now yeah i think the challenge with lithium is well the the fire is the extreme one which we all fear to some extent some don't but certainly i do um i think the other issue too is when they do shut down uh, because of the vms the battery management system decides to shut down the battery the challenge is the collateral damage that happens with the drop-in replacements yeah and and also for the owner to suddenly not have power anymore. It's great that your battery didn't catch on fire and it protected itself, but a boat without power mm -hmm. is can be pretty serious, especially if you're used to navigation with your char plotter and your char plotter is powered off the house battery bank. And now suddenly you lose all navigation. You don't have GPS. You don't have you don't have nothing. You know even, even your windlass won't work. You're just drifting. And uh, that's probably the fears that we're more worried about. We always worry about the fire for sure, but then we worry about the systems failing and the electrical system suddenly disappearing underneath an owner and they're just on a boat floating away without VHF again. All these problems that can happen when suddenly your battery bank just decides to protect itself and you can't run anything anymore. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? How are you guys alleviating those sort of concerns? Yeah, so on that's the one of the things in the ABYC standard is to uh, define the critical circuits on the boat and to make sure that there's a redundant uh, power source for them. And it can be another lithium-ion battery bank, or it could be a lead-acid bank or whatever. Uh, the, other, the other thing we have to think about is there are a lot more constraints with lithium-ion than there are with, with uh, lead-acid, uh, particularly temperature. Uh, you, can't, you can discharge a lithium-ion battery, most of them down to about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, but you can't recharge them at that temperature. So if you're boating, for example, in, in Minnesota on the Great Lakes in the wintertime, or you're in Maine, or you're on a lobster boat, we have 5,000 lobster boats, and um, you put lithium-ion batteries on the boat and you decide to go lobstering in January, um, you probably won't be able to use that battery unless it's got some kind of a, a uh, heating system built into it, which basically none of our boat batteries have. And then at the other end of the extreme, if you're, say, in Miami in the summertime and you've You've left the boat closed up for the week, and the inside temperature's risen to, to 50 or 60 C. Um, once again, you're not, you can't use that battery. Uh, you can't recharge it. M many of the older ones, the threshold for recharge is 40 to 45 C. Um, some of the newer ones are now 55 C. But, but on a closed up boat in, in a hot climate, you can get to those kind of ambient temperatures. And then the, there's one that, that, um, We've learned the hard way, all, pretty much all of these BMSs have a current sensor in them. And if they see the current, the amp draw go above a certain threshold, they disconnect. Well, you have a boat with a big bow thruster and you flick the bow thruster on and all of a sudden it's pulling 500 amps and the BMS has got a 300 amp threshold, uh, the battery disconnects from the boat. Uh, and so with a lead acid battery, you hit it with 500 amps, the voltage just sags. Uh, yeah. It doesn't disconnect from the boat. Uh, it might impair the performance. Same way with the temperature. The temperature goes above 50 or 60 C. It's going to greatly shorten the life of the, the battery. 
but it's not going to disconnect from the boat or say you can't use it anymore. And you go down to minus 20, it's still going to function. It's just going to have a much less uh, usable capacity than, than you would have at, at a normal temperature. So, so we don't have these, um, these uh, issues on temperature extremes and current extremes and so on uh, with lead acid that we have with, with um, lithium ion. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration. And now when we, when we talk to somebody about a lithium ion installation, we make them collect all of this data so that we can make sure the battery is going to not be put into a situation where it's operating outside of these parameters. Yeah. Because otherwise, uh, we just have unhappy customers. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Nothing like uh, losing a vacation, <laughs> you know uh, honestly. <laughs> so you get it wrong, and when, when they, uh, the first thing they're going to do is come back to us and, and complain. <laughs> As they should, you know, honestly. Uh, yeah, many of yeah, us fight I mean, for our holidays. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's what's on the line. Fighting for our yeah. holidays, yeah. fighting for our time on the water. Um, do you want to talk about a little bit, uh, one of the common things that's um, a proponent, or not a proponent, but a pro of lithium is the, uh, like we talked about earlier, the charge acceptance rate, the CAR. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, CAR being a unit of one, and then 70% means 70% capacity of the max charging acceptance rate. Do you want to talk a little bit about how do boaters take advantage of that high car rate for some of the lithium batteries? And also, what are the limitations? Yes, so that high charge acceptance rate is, is not much use unless you have the ability to use it. Um, and that's where something like the integral alternator, or if you've got an AC generator on the boat and you have a big bank of battery chargers, um, yeah. uh, you can pump in a, a ton of amps into a battery and store a lot of energy quite quickly. And, and then um, your engine runtime, whatever the energy source is for charging, uh, doesn't have to run for hours at a time. And that's a huge benefit over lead acid because, as we know, once you get much above 50, 60 percent, say, the charge, the charge acceptance rate tapers off. It doesn't matter how big an alternator you've got or battery charger, uh, the batteries won't accept the amperage. And so it takes hours to fully charge the battery. But you know, and, and on our boat, for example, with that eight kilowatt integral system and our lithium ion batteries, uh, we can quite literally pump certainly at least six and, and very often more than six kilowatt hours of electricity into the batteries in one hour. Yeah, uh, that's... in the past with lead acid and uh, even with a 200 amp alternator, that would have taken us two or three hours. So we can dramatically reduce the time it takes to charge the batteries and, uh, and the engine run time on the boat. And, and the corollary to that is that we're putting a substantially higher load on the engine when we're battery charging, which is way more fuel efficient and also better for the engine in terms of life expectancy and reduced maintenance. So yeah. there really are no negatives to this. I mean, it's just one benefit after another that stacks up. Um, the, the higher the charge acceptance rate and the more we can take advantage of it. Yeah, and here in the Pacific... Well, those two things, again, have to run together. You know, we, we went through a phase where we got increasingly powerful alternators, but the battery charge acceptance rate didn't really improve. So then on a lot of applications, we couldn't really use that um, output from the alternators after the first 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and now we've gone the other way where the batteries have a very high charge acceptance rate and the charging devices are playing catch up. Uh, and, uh, and then if we can get both of those working together, then we have qualitatively better systems than we've had in the past. I mean, this isn't just a a small change. It's a really quite a dramatic change in in how we operate our boats and how long we have to run our engines and, and how inefficient or inefficient everything is. Yeah, and we see the same thing with power boaters, and you mentioned it with the generators. Um, a lot of power boaters have large generators to run uh, large air conditioning systems, which we don't always use. And uh, you can, you're right. the The big advantage um, is stacking these high output chargers. And generally in 100 amps, uh, in either a 12 or 24 volts, and stacking them um, and having them, you know, the max I've seen is uh, 350 amps at 24 volts going in a large battery bank. And it's a game changer, right? The generator could handle it. Yeah. Generator is yeah. properly loaded. 
uh, and you're literally in the matter of hours doing what used to take half a day or what felt like forever. Like you, you couldn't step off the gas, you know, as soon as you stop running the generator, some boats have undersized battery chargers, only 50 amp at 12 volts, uh, tiny little battery chargers. And it takes forever for them to get that battery bank charged up, either being a lead acid, AGM, or even a lithium. So you're right that it, it is a qualitative difference in a reducing that nuisance and the gen set and the engines want to run loaded like you said so it is a win-win-win but it is an investment to get there i mean those are not trivial dollars uh you know it, it you need to have a real problem before you solve that problem because otherwise the costs uh, are a little bit hard to swallow if you don't believe in the benefits uh, at yeah. the out, at the end well one of my uh, yeah. targets um for some time which, which i haven't gone around to, to going after yet but i want to is the trolley yacht market. You have an awful lot of trolley yachts up in your part of the world. Uh, they All of them have at least one generator. Many of them have two generators. Yeah. Um, we could certainly eliminate one generator from all of those boats with uh, some of these uh, optimized DC systems. And in many of those applications, especially if they've got twin engines, we could get rid of all the generators altogether. If you put two uh, integral systems, for example, on two engines, you've got the equivalent of a 30 kilowatt generator on the boat, um, which is operating any time you run the engines for propulsion purposes. And uh, and so, and it makes the whole system way more efficient, and it means you don't have the added maintenance, you don't have all the insulation issues with the other generators. Uh, and it's a pretty obvious target for, for me. Uh, it's just a, a, a bit of a hard sell to get people to change their whole, you know, they, they come to think that they're generate is an essential piece of equipment and the bottom line yeah, is it, and it, it doesn't have anymore. to be right like you're right you know, the technology has changed enough in the last five to ten years to not only make the generator obsolete but actually to gen to create systems that are, are, are way more efficient and uh, with significant lifestyle benefits over having the generator on the boat and we need to get that message out there and we need to start um, getting some manufacturers on board so that so, so that the uh, the public gets their heads around this. If we look at the um, the catamaran market, the balanced mm. catamarans, which is a really successful brand out of South Africa, um, a year or so ago they stopped putting generators on those boats. They all have air conditioning in three or four cabins, and started putting two integral systems on each of those boats, and uh, the the owners love it. And they don't need generators, and they're running air conditioning systems in often four cabins in the saloon. And uh, we can do exactly the same to a whole range of other boating activities where for decades we've assumed that a generator is an essential piece of equipment. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways of doing it, right? It's just being creative and seeing about budgets. And you're right, sometimes the generators do die or they're dying or they're giving you a lot of problem. I see boat or power boaters that never had a generator that wish they did. And you can find a ways to give them the benefits of having power regeneration without a generator. Or, and like you mentioned, uh, some power boaters eventually, you know, might take two generators to one, uh, or they might simply have one that's just giving them always grief and they just take it out of the system altogether. And it really depends on what the boater's trying to do, how far they're gonna be from shore power for how long, how much money are they willing to put into being away from shore power and having that generation? I guess it's a lot of it's possible. The question is, it's all about trade-offs, time and money. Time and money <laughs> is really I, what it comes down to None of this stuff is cheap, me. as you know. <laughs> That's nope. the nature of boating. <laughs> no, no, it is <laughs> not. That's it, why so. it's, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, not it's not for everyone. Uh, you know, it's got to be. It's no. not even if you had the money. Not everyone needs it. It really depends on the individual, and um, and what they're looking for. There's a solution out there. The question is, which one aligns better with what you're hoping to get out of it, and how much money are you willing to spend yeah. to chase for it? Yeah, definitely. So if you're curious again, go on our website and find out more answers and solutions with this sort of setup. And thanks for asking. And thanks for all of you for listening and tuning in.